All right. It says in Luke uh, 15 and verse 4, he said uh, he goes after the one that's lost, so astray is interpreted as lost, until he find it. And when he hath found it, he layeth it on his shoulders rejoicing. And when he cometh home, he calleth together his friends and neighbors, saying unto them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. I say unto you that likewise joy shall be in heaven over one sinner. One sinner. You know what he compares that lost sheep compared to? A lost sinner repenting. You know what happened? He was saved and lost it, and the Lord got him back, according to Scripture. Now, I'm just teaching a literal interpretation of this, which makes the perfect sense. Now, you can preach a spiritual application and make a, a great message out of this and preach, you know, for unsaved people to get saved, but that's a spiritual application. Doctrinally, it's a person that's saved and lost and got it back. Verse 7, And I say unto you, likewise, joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repenteth, more, uh, more than over ninety and nine just persons which need no repentance. Well, see, he was one, at one time one of those just persons because there was a hundred, remember, a hundred at first, and the one that got lost. And that he needed repentance, a lost, a lost person that said needed repentance. And he goes on. Now that shows you that uh, in, the, in, the, in the time where Christ was living, you could lose it, get it back, lose it, and then different things. Now that seems strange. It's foreign to a Baptist ear. That's very foreign. But it's scriptural. How many believe that? Say amen. All right. It's right there in your Bible. And there's hundreds of other scriptures to prove that. Come to Matthew 18. Look at Matthew 18, verse 11. For the Son of Man has come to save that which was lost. How think ye, if a man have an hundred sheep, and one of them be gone astray, doth not he leave the ninety and nine, and goeth into the mountains, and seeketh that which is gone astray? Uh, yes. Uh, and, if, and if so be that he find it, verily I say unto you, he rejoiceth more of that sheep than of the ninety and nine which went not astray. And you saw the parallel count in Luke 15. Verse 14. Even so, it is not the will of your Father, which is in heaven, that one of these little ones should perish. Now, now, now watch this. You know I'm going to blast Calvinism again. And it's not a hobby horse. It's just when it comes up, I'll hit it. Watch this. Now watch. You know the, the will of God. Now is the will of God something that's supposed to be a, a, a certain thing? Right? That's, that's Calvin. Watch verse 14. Even so it is not the what? The will of God or the will of your Father which is in heaven that one of these little ones perish. Do they perish or do any of them perish? They do perish, but it's the will of God they don't. How come they do if it's the will of God they don't? You see? You understand that? That means the will of God is broken. God didn't have his way. Now, I'm not being funny. I'm not slighting God one bit. I'm not slighting God. But it isn't the will of the Father that one in heaven that one of his little ones perish. But they do, which shows you that Calvin is shot. <laughs> Calvin don't know what in the world he's talking about. Because they do. Now, I, I agree, it's not, it, the, the parallel passage for this is 2 Peter 3, 9. He said, God's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God doesn't want anybody to go to hell. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But they do. Now look at 19, chapter 19, verse 13. <clears throat> 19, 13. Then were, uh, then were there brought unto him little children, that he should put his hands upon them and pray, and the disciples rebuked them. But Jesus said, Suffer little children, and forbid them not to come unto me, for of such is the kingdom of what? The kingdom of heaven. And he laid his hands on them and departed thence. So, uh, uh, parents, if your little children want to get saved, don't discourage them from coming to the Lord Jesus Christ. And parents, the same thing. Don't, if, don't force them into a decision. Any little ch child will make a decision for you any time. But if the child's ready and they want to come to Christ and they want to come forward and do things that are, you know, they want to do things godly, don't dampen their spirits. Because if you offend a little one that believes in Christ, better a millstone hang around your neck. That's what God thinks of a person, a father, a mother, or a teacher. Even a teacher or a preacher. Say a little children want to go out visiting. I say, oh, you're, not, you're, too, old, you're too young to go out visiting, pass out tracks. That's ridiculous. Well, listen, God wouldn't be too pleased with my attitude, would he? Little children, there, we had eight or eight little children, almost eight, uh, actually eight young people. <laughs> eight young people uh, for visitation Saturday morning. And uh, that's a blessing. We want you to keep coming. Keep coming to visitation. That's a great time to be there and listen to the tapes and enjoy the refreshments and, and pass out tracts and learn how to be witnesses for the Lord Jesus Christ. And you're not too young. And if you offend one of those little ones and, and, and look down your nose like, oh, what, are you, what can you do? They just might win a lot more souls than you would. That's what they might do. <laughs> and God just takes the foolish things of this world to confound the wise. 
And the things that you're not to bring to naught the things that are. God just might just fix your wagon and we'll let them be a great soul winner and you'd get nobody. <laughs> All right, now come back to Matthew 18 and look at verse 14. Even so it is not the will of your Father which is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. Verse 15, the paragraph mark, 15. Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. If he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. That's a good thing to do. Now, we, if you've got a problem, get the thing cleared up because you're an ache and you bring sin in the camp if you don't get something like that cleared up. Um, the Bible says, listen closely, the Bible says in Proverbs 25, verse 9, write it down, Proverbs 25, 9, debate, excuse me, debate thy cause with thy neighbor himself and discover not a secret to another. Did you hear that? Debate thy cause with thy neighbor himself. If you've got to say something, do it privately. And, that, that's a, and a preacher is probably more uh, apt to mess up like that than anybody because he can say something from the pulpit when he should be very careful about saying things from the pulpit and should do things, some things privately. You see what I'm trying to say? A preacher can mess up from the a pulpit and you say, well, preacher, you're guilty of that. Well, you get up here and speak for hundreds of hours and see if you don't slip a few times. <laughs> you know, and a preacher can call somebody on the floor and rebuke somebody where probably he should have done it privately rather than publicly. And, uh, and uh, preachers are guilty of that. I'm guilty of that. And pray for me so I can get straightened out on that. I don't think I've done it that bad, but I have at other churches in the past. Now, you're to debate, you're debate your cause with a neighbor himself. Come back to Matthew 18, verse 15. Moreover, thy brother shall trespass against thee. Go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. If he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. But if he will not hear thee, then take with thee uh, one or two more, that in the mouth of one or, uh, excuse me, two or three witnesses, every word may be established. Well, you know what that is. That's a picture of Titus chapter 3, verse 10. He said, after the first and second admonition, reject, knowing that such is a heretic. A heretic, you're to reject after the first and second admonition. Now, verses 15 and 16 says, you go between you and him alone. If that doesn't work, you get two or three with you to go with you. If that doesn't work, you're not to do anything. You're to turn it over to the church. And after the first and second admonition, reject, Titus 3.10. Now look at verse 17. And if he shall neglect to hear them, tell it unto the church. But if he neglect to hear the church, let him be unto thee as a heathen man and a publican. A heathen. You know what a heathen is? A lost person. Now that's not saying, you can't say to a guy, you're lost because you didn't hear the church. But let him be like a heathen man, or as a heathen man and a publican. You know what that means? Remove his or her membership. That's what you do. When you let him be as a heathen or a publican, that means you remove a membership. That's what the scriptures teach. That's called church discipline. And I've never had to remove anybody's membership. I've never, in fact, I've never, in any church I've been, I've never had to bring a matter to the congregation. In fact, I have never had to take two or three witnesses with me. Never have. I have gone on my own. And I told them it was the first step of church discipline. And I told them what would happen if they didn't get right. And they left the church. And so it solved all kinds of problems. And I was glad. Praise the Lord. That's the way it should have happened. And God blessed. And they've left the church in that way. That's after the first one. I told them this is going to happen. And I wept while I was doing it. I wept and I said, listen, I love you. And this is wrong. And they said, we know we're wrong. I mean, they, I mean, they broke down. We know we're wrong. And I said, well, just come to church and confess and get that right. They come to church. And they told several people they were sorry. But then they didn't, they did, I couldn't believe it. I mean, it was a great blessing. How many, oh, I should keep my mouth shut. But uh, the thing is, they, then they left and never came back. Never came back. And I don't know why. Because they confessed to me, they confessed to several people in the church, and then, and then after that, they didn't come back. I don't know what happened. Don't know what happened. But God's had his hand in it, and that's what should have happened. All right? Uh, notice again, in verse 17, And if he shall neglect to hear them, tell it unto the church. But if he neglect to hear the church, let him be unto thee as a heathen man and a publican. Remove his membership. And a person has their membership removed, cannot vote. They can still come to the church and attend church services. We're not going to have the deacons at the doors with shovels and picks saying, you can't come in here, you're a heathen and publican. They can come to any church service they want. You've got to use your head. You see what I'm saying? They can come, but they're not a member. They can't vote. They don't have a right to speak up and say anything. You know, they, uh, of course, we believe in uh, open communion, so you can't shut them off from communion that way, but a lot of churches do. 
when your church membership is moved, they take cut, you're cut off from communion too. We don't believe that, but a lot of churches practice that. <clears throat> now, notice this. Look at the end of 17. You want a proof of inspiration of the Bible? You want to, I want to prove to you the Bible's inspired. Let him be unto thee as an heathen man and a what? Who's writing this book? And what is Matthew? You think Matthew's going to talk about himself that way? No, sir, not unless this Bible's the Word of God and inspired. If man would have been writing that book, he wouldn't have lowered himself to such a place. Only God wrote something like that. That's inspiration. You see that thing? You don't discredit your own job like that. God said it, not in Matthew's going, do I have to say publican, Lord? Yes, Matthew, write it down. And Lord just, okay, <laughs> wrote the thing down. It's inspiration. That's in, a proof of inspiration. All right, now look at verse uh, 18. Verily I say unto you, uh, notice when he says in verse 17, tell it to the church. We know no church has been started yet. We know no local church has been started yet. And what does church mean? Somebody give me a definition. Congregation or what's another word? That's right. Assembly. And we learned that apart from the Greek and Hebrew. We learned that from comparing scriptures and Hebrew and Psalms back and forth, right? And so church means congregation or assembly. When does the church start, according to John 7? The Holy Spirit was not yet given because that Jesus Christ was not yet what? Glorified. It says it, the Holy Spirit was not yet given because that Jesus Christ was not yet glorified. And, and he says, for we are all baptized by one spirit into the body of Christ. When you're baptized by the Holy Spirit in the body of Christ, that's, you're part of the church. But see, the church didn't start until after Jesus Christ's death, burial, and resurrection and glorification. So this church is just referring... Remember what Stephen said in Acts chapter 7? The church in the wilderness. Remember that? There, and we know what church in the wilderness meant. It's an assembly. It's a congregation in the wilderness. It's talking about Moses 40 years in the wilderness. Now look at verse 18. Verily I say unto you, whatsoever you shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatsoever you shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Now, what does loose mean? The Catholic Church uses this, of course, to damn people's souls and everything else. And what a mess. You know how they, they have the keys, I, the two keys of Peter. I, I say unto thee, thou art Peter, and upon this rock I'll build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I'll give thee the keys of the kingdom. Remember how I said that in Matthew 16? Well, the Catholics say that's what it is. Remember, look at verse, look at verse 27, same chapter. Then the Lord of that servant was moved with compassion and loosed him and what? Forgave. You know what loosed means? It means forgave, forg forgiving, to loose. So therefore, look at verse 18 again. <clears throat> Verily I say unto you, and he's referring to the assembly or congregation of the church in verse 17. Verily I say unto you, whatsoever you shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. That's talking about the church. That means if you don't confess your sins down here, they're bound up there, and you're going to face them at the judgment seat of Christ. And whatsoever you shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. You get forgiveness and patch up bad relationships down here, it'll be loosed up there. You say, preacher, how can you say that? Verse 15, 16, and 17. If you've got a brother at fault, you go to him and tell him. If he don't hear, you take two or three witnesses. If they don't hear that, tell it to the church. That's disputes between brethren. You know what the problem is when a brother don't get right? He won't forgive you, right? And you, you see, the, the problem is forgiveness. Isn't that right? So Christ says, Verily I say unto you, whatsoever you shall bind on earth, if you refuse to get forgiveness and forgive others, it will be bound in heaven. You'll meet that sin at the judgment seat of Christ. And whatsoever you shall loose on earth, we see in the verse 27, loose means forgive. Whatsoever you shall loose, if you get things patched up, it will be loosed in heaven. Peachy keen. You get up to have a clean conscience and meet at the judgment seat of Christ with a clear conscience on that matter. Amen? You see, okay. Um, <clears throat> for example, 1 Corinthians chapter 5. It's reported commonly that there is fornication among you. <clears throat> and, and such fornication is so, is so, should not be so much as named among the Gentiles that one should have his father's wife. Remember that man? He said, he said when I am with you in the spirit to deliver such an one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Then he said, pray that God will kill that guy and get his stinking Christian testimony out of here, but he'll go to heaven. That's what he said. Now, you know what happened? You read 2 Corinthians chapter 2. And you know what? That, that God, they did, God didn't kill that guy. They prayed for him that that guy would be forgiven. And you know, instead of God choosing to kill that guy, that guy got his heart right. When all those people started praying for him, he got his heart right. And Paul says, rather forgive such one and restore such an one. He was allowed to come back in the congregation. 
You see what I'm saying? His membership was removed. They prayed that, that Satan would take him home and get him out of here. He would take his body, but his soul and spirit would go to heaven, eternal security. And then in 2 Corinthians 2, he said, restore such an one. Let him back into the membership. I mean, let him back in. He got right with God. There's an example of that thing. Now look at verse 19. Again, I say unto you that if two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything, that they shall ask, it shall be done, uh, done for them of my Father which is in heaven. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. Does anybody want to comment on that briefly? Anybody want to comment? What do you think? Yes, or uh, Ed. Okay, uh, Paul, go ahead. Say that again, please. According to the scripture, it's a fail-proof way of getting answer to prayer. Okay, let me ask you this. Is, it, is this verse 19 and 20 for us today, Chris? Okay, um, Ed, do you agree it's not for us today? You agree, right? Ed and Paul, you agree it's not for us today. All right. You see, there's prayer promises in the Bible that are not for us, and there are prayer promises that are for us. Now, let's look at the verse again. Now, I know some of you have claimed it before. I've claimed it when I was in ignorance as a Christian. And, and you know what? Either God's a liar or something's wrong somewhere. Look at verse 19. Again, I say unto you that if two of you shall agree on earth as touching what? Anything that they shall ask, it shall be done. It didn't say might be done. It shall be done for them of my Father which is in heaven. Now, you see that thing? He said, if you agree on touching anything, it will be done. How many of you have ever prayed that and it wasn't done? Ever. Raise your hand. Be honest. Okay, a lot. Now listen, I'm being, I'm being, being kind. I'm, going to be, I'm, I'm being sarcastic and kind of using irony to get across the point. Either God is a liar or this prayer promise is not for us. Now, it's easier. What's your, what's your choice going to be? Listen, brother, it's God's not a liar. Let, true, let God be true and every man a liar. God's not a liar. God cannot lie. It's impossible for God to lie. And I believe every word in this book. But we understand the Bible says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And there's proper places. This is an apostolic, uh, apostolic prayer promised to the apostles. They're about to enter into Daniel's 70th week in the tribulation period. You've got to keep that in mind. They're just about to ready into the, into, into the tribulation period. When Christ is preaching, they're in the 69th week of Daniel. Now, there's many places in the Bible there's promises like that. Who can think of another place? Can anybody think of another one? Yeah. James? Okay. Okay, can anybody think of another one? I'll read that one in James. It says in the book of James, and the prayer of the faith shall save the sick. Remember that? The prayer of the faith shall save the sick. Now, is there any, is, in James 5, is there any place for a misfire or a dud? And the prayer of the faith shall save the sick. Well, there's many times where guys pray and say, we're going to claim this promise. God said that. Listen, a lot of people died. Either God's a liar or the promise is not for us. James 1.1 1, 1 says to the 12 tribes scattered abroad. James chapter 2 says faith without works is dead. It's faith and works combination in the tribulation. Ed, do you think of another one? Some people are stuck in their ways. I mean, if they want to, if they want to get to, you know what happens? We know what Christians do when they claim all these promises in the Bible on prayer. There's certain promises. I'll show you one. Ask and it shall be given you. Seek and you shall find. Knock and it shall be opened to you. Matthew seven seven. Is that for you? No, sir. And I don't care what the greatest preacher in America says. How many has ever done that and didn't get an answer to prayer? Be honest. I have done it. Have you? Are you telling the truth? <laughs> all right. Ask and it shall be given you. You tell me every time you've asked, it's been given you. If you are, you're the greatest person I ever met in my life. Man, you're the greatest person I ever met in my life. I never met anybody that's had a prayer answer to every prayer they've ever asked. Ask and it shall be, you know who he's talking to? The apostles. Seek and ye shall find. Knock and it shall be open unto you. Now that's a good, a good thing. It's like saying continue, continue, continue. But you know what they got to do? They got to take the Greek and Hebrew to make the thing fit for us today. You don't take the Greek, and word, the Greek to change the word of God to fit us. If it doesn't fit, you put it somewhere else. There's plenty of prayer promises for us besides all the apostolic ones that are for tribulation saints and everything. Can anybody think of another one in the Bible where it's, where, 
Yes. Say it again. No, that's conditional upon the words abiding you. He said, if ye abide in me and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will and it shall be done unto you. That's conditioned upon the word of God abiding in the heart. And if the word of God's abiding in your heart, that'll work. That'll work. That's a good one for a Christian. If, you, if ye abide in me, if you're abiding in Christ, and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will, and it shall be done. Because if you're truly abiding in Christ, you're only going to ask what's in his will. And if you're truly abiding in the word, his words abiding in you, you're going to only ask what's in his will. See, that one's different. But I appreciate you bringing it up. That's a good, that's a good point to show the contrast. That one's conditional. Um, You've got other conditional ones. Now, this is a serious point because you know what happened to Christians? They claim these prayer promises, and they don't work, and they quit praying. They quit praying. And that's a danger. And I'm trying to show you why some of these prayers don't work, and I want Christians to pray. I'm not trying to discourage you. I'm trying to help you to realize why you uh, have been trying to find fault with God privately. <laughs> And that's what goes on, you know. People find fault with God privately and say, well, God didn't answer my prayer. And he said he would. What's wrong with his word? You know, people do that all the time. Here's one, a good one. Uh, John, 1 John 5 and verse 14. And this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. And if we know that he hear us, whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desired of him. If we ask anything according to what? His will, not our will which those other promises were. They had apostolic signs. Listen, you couldn't raise the dead like Peter. You couldn't cast out devils. You couldn't heal the sick like all them. They had special privileges you don't. So any, other, any others, can you think of any others that go either way? Promises for us or promises that are not for us? Can anybody think any quickly? I wanted to have some feedback so you, so you folks know what we're doing here. Anybody else? Yes, Paul. Seven or twenty-four, Matthew twenty-one. What? Okay. See that one doesn't work for us either. Now, I'm being honest. Whatsoever you shall ask in prayer, believing that you'll receive something like that, right? We said, brother, I believe, I believe, I believe, I believe, and nothing happened. Is there something wrong with God? No, sir. There's nothing wrong with God. That's like trying to get the apostolic gifts and trying to speak in tongues. Listen, everybody in this room is a dispensationalist. I'll show you. Do you do you believe in going to church on Saturday? No, then you, the see, you've changed from the Old Testament to now. Do you believe in speaking in tongues for today? No. You see, but they did at one time. It's okay to eat pork today, right? It wasn't at one time, so you're a dispensationalist. To some degree, it all depends to what degree you are. Okay. Now, um, can anybody think of any others? I'm just checking with you. Giving you an opportunity. All right, let's go back to Matthew 18. We are going a little bit over time. Matthew 18, that's a very important point. You need to find the scriptures that will help you in prayer. Uh, the, Jesus Christ said in uh, Luke 18, verse 1, He said, He spake a parable unto them that men ought always to pray and not to faint. You know, either you're, if you're a praying Christian, you're, you're not a fainting Christian. If you're a fainting Christian, then you're a um, praying Christian, or not a praying Christian. <laughs> and Paul says, continuing instant in prayer, let your requests be made known unto God. Remember Paul said that in Philippians 4, and continue instant in prayer. And pray without ceasing. Paul said, pray, pray, pray. But you won't find one of those uh, unconditional prayer promises from Paul ever. You'll never find in the 13 epistles by Paul one of those promises that, you know, like, uh, if you just pray, God will give it to you. No, sir. Paul has conditions on them. Read them and you'll see that. Matthew 18, and look at verse 20. For, there, for where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I in the midst of them. Amen. That's, that's real simple to grasp, and he's here tonight with us. 21. Then came Peter to him and said, Lord, how oft shall my brother sin against me, and I forgive him? Till seven times? <laughs> Peter always is sticking his foot in his mouth. <clears throat> Do you remember? You remember the one apostle came to the Lord Jesus Christ, and he says, he said, Master, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? And he said, Why callest thou me good? There's none good but one that is God. He said, If thou wilt enter into life, keep the commandments. He saith unto him, Which? Remember, always trying to find a way to get out. Always trying to justify the flesh. Which? He said, Keep the commandments. And the man goes, Which? And Peter goes, Peter's trying to find a loophole to get out of this. He just heard all about disputes between brethren. You know, go to your brethren. If it don't work, take two or three. And if it don't work, go to the church. If it don't work, you know, binding and loosing and all the way through there. The context, we've got to keep the context. And he says, Lord, how many times do I got to do this? 
This is tough. He's trying to find a way out. You remember the one time, uh, the, um, the Good Samaritan, and Jesus Christ talking about going to your neighbor, and he goes, and who is my neighbor? <laughs> trying to find a loophole, trying to get out of it. And here's Peter trying to get out. <clears throat> he says, till seven times. Look at, uh, look at verse 22. Jesus saith unto him, I say not unto thee until seven times, but until 490 times. Seventy times seven. What's 490 remind you of? Don't you know that Jesus Christ is trying to interject something here to try to get them to think? He's always impressing on their minds Daniel's 70 weeks. 70 weeks? How many days in a week? Seven. 70 times 7? 490 years. When Jesus Christ is preaching this, there's been 483 years. There's seven to go. Tribulation. See that thing? He says until 70 times 7. You say, oh, preacher, that's taking it too far. I don't think so. What's until 70? Look, at the, I'm going to read and I'm going to stop and you tell me the word. Until 70 times. What's a time in the Bible? Until time, times, and a half a time. What's a time? A year. 490 years. There's Daniel 70 weeks. Until, until 70 times 7. A time, times, and a half a time. Three and a half years, which is referred to in Re Revelation 13. Now, he, Jesus Christ says, you're to forgive your brother 70 times 7. But there's conditions. Look at the conditions. Look at Luke chapter 17. Now, this is a blessing. We can get a lot of blessings from this. Look at Luke 17. There's some of you guys in here that need this. <laughs> and I mean, I've trespassed against you. You need to forgive me. I'm serious. You say, but that preacher, he's done that three times to me. Well, then you've only got 487 more times to forgive me. <laughs> you've only, and you need to keep it up. You need, I mean, I've botched it up. You've got only 487 times to forgive me. And uh, you know the ladies working with me in the school. You know what you think they get mad at me once in a while? Mrs. Henson, she's only got three left to forgive me. She's already forgiven me 487 times. <laughs> I'm having fun. But look at Luke chapter 17. <clears throat> look at Luke 17 verse 3. Take heed to yourselves. If thy brother trespass against thee, rebuke him. And if he repent, forgive him. Notice, if he repent, forgive him. It didn't say you had to forgive him if he didn't repent. Look at verse 4. And if he trespass against thee seven times in a day, and seven times in a day turn again to thee, saying, I repent, thou shalt forgive him. And look what it says. And the apostle said, Lord, increase our faith. <laughs> Man, I, can't, I couldn't put up with anybody seven times and increase our faith, Lord. That's tough. I mean, you know, you get together, you know, you get close with somebody and you, you, you mess up all the time. Husbands and wives need to remember this. Amen? Husband and wives need to remember it. And uh, you might mess up and you just need, you need to turn and say, Honey, I'm sorry. And you say, well, now here's the thing, though. You don't have to forgive them unless they repent. You say, well, that don't sound right. Listen, does God have to forgive you if you don't repent? God only forgives you based upon repentance. God doesn't have to be a nicey-wicey and he just forgives everybody and smiles and overlooks your sins at the day of judgment. He only forgives on, ba on the basis of repentance. If you repent, he forgives. And Christians always, you know, a lot of Christians are taught, you're to forgive them anyhow, even if they repent or not. The Bible didn't say that. God's not like that. That doesn't mean you're to hold a grudge and, and get, the Bible says, let not the sun go down upon your wrath. There's a balance. You're to get the thing straightened out so you don't have bitterness and animosity in your heart unless you bite and devour one another and be consumed one of another. It'll eat you out like a cancer if you don't get the thing right in your own heart. But the thing is, you don't have to forgive them until they come to you. You know what most people do? I'm serious. Now, I'm, I'm taking time tonight, but we need to take time. People come, and I'll have people... I've seen this before. I'll go to somebody and I'll, I'll, say, I'll say, hey, I, I messed up. I said something to you the other day and I was wrong. And they'll say, oh, that's okay, that's okay. No, it's not. You say, I forgive you. It's not okay. If it had been okay, I wouldn't have came to you in the first place. You understand what I'm trying to say? When some, you know, people don't know how to say, I forgive you. You need to learn how to say, somebody comes to you and say, hey, I messed up. Don't say, well, that's all right, brother, it's okay, just forget it. No, I say, I appreciate you coming and I forgive you. I appreciate it. You need to learn how to say, I forgive you and get the thing. You hear people do that all the time. It's all right, forget it, don't worry about it. No, nothing. don't worry about it, nothing. it didn't bother me a bit. You say, yes, sir, 
<laughs> and forgive them. Now that's important. We don't do that much. We need to learn how to talk to people and don't excuse their sin. We're excusing sin by saying, that's all right, brother, it didn't mean anything. Else. No, forget it, forget it. No. <laughs> if he forgets it, next time he ain't going to come to you. And he needs to have his heart right. All right, Matthew 18. Matthew 18. Jesus Christ said, until 70 times 7. So therefore, you have to forgive somebody 490 times. You say, what if it's 491? You don't have to worry about that. You don't have to worry about that. There's always a person. You're just like the guy saying, and who is my neighbor? Which, Lord, which commandments? And do I have to do it seven times? What if, what if there's you people today? Um, that's, what if it's 491? Every one of you about thinking that. You don't have to worry about that. If, it's, if a guy actually turns around and says, I'm, you know, how many times have you ever had anybody in your life turn around seven times in a day and said, I'm sorry, I repent? I don't think too many people have ever had that done from the same person that messed up on you seven times. And yet, seven times, that would be 70 days and messing up 70, seven times a day for 70 days. And nobody's asking, God, don't have to worry about it happening. Don't have to worry about it. <clears throat> now come back to Matthew 19. So you, you guys need to forgive me. You've know, you got a lot, a lot of time left here. <laughs> Matthew 18. Look at verse 23. This is going to go kind of fast from here on. Matthew 18, 23. Therefore is the kingdom of heaven likened unto a certain king which would take account of his servants. And this is a picture. Now, what's the kingdom of heaven? Somebody answer me. What is the kingdom of heaven? The millennial, literal, physical, visible reign of Jesus Christ on a thousand, for a thousand years on this earth. The kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God are two different things. The kingdom of God is spiritual. The kingdom of heaven is physical, literal, on this earth for a thousand years in the millennium. So that will help you understand this parable. Therefore, as the kingdom of heaven, that's the millennium, is likened to a certain king which would take... See, Christ is going to be king in the millennium. He's not king now. He's not king now at all. Which would take account of his servants. And when he had begun to reckon, one was brought unto him which owed him 10,000 talents. But for as much as he had not to pay, had nothing to pay, his Lord commanded him to be sold and his wife and his children and all that he had in payment to be made. He didn't go to hell. Keep this in mind. He didn't have to go to hell. He wasn't cast bodily into hell. The servant therefore fell down and worshipped him, saying, Lord, have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. Then the Lord of that servant was moved with compassion and loosed him and forgave him. There's what loosing and forgiving means the same thing. Loosed him and forgave him the debt. But the same servant went out and found one of his fellow servants, which owed him a hundred pence, a real little amount compared to 10,000 talents. And he laid his hands upon him and took him by the throat, saying, Pay me all that thou owest. Pay me all. Taking him by the throat. What a nasty, mean guy. He just got forgiveness. And he goes out and grabs somebody by the throat and says, Pay what you owe me right now. Pay what you owe me. And verse 29, And his fellow servant fell down at his feet and besought him, saying, Have patience with me and I will pay thee all. Exact same prayer is verse 26. Exact same prayer. 30. And he would not, but went and cast him into prison till he should pay the debt. That's debtor's prison. You ever heard of debtor's prison? They should have that today. You go up and cast him into prison to pay the debt, and he worked, works it out, and pays the debt until you get and pay the thing. Now, here's what happened. You have the king sitting over here, and this guy owes 10,000 talents. He says, I'm going to command your wife, children, the whole thing to be sold. And he falls down, and, says, and, and this, the master, the king, had compassion. This guy said, I'll pay you. I'll pay you. Have mercy on me. This guy goes out that owes 10,000 talents to that guy, grabs this guy that owes him 100 pence by the throat, and the, he besought him and asked the same thing that he, this guy asked the king. You see what happened? I mean, a terrible situation. And he cast him, and then this guy, this guy that owes, this guy that owes 10,000 talents to this guy, he cast that guy into prison until he'd pay him 100 pence. Now look at verse 31. So when his fellow servants saw what was done, uh, people that uh, saw what happened, they were very sorry and came and told unto their Lord all that was done. Then his Lord, after they had called him, said unto him, O thou wicked servant, I forgave thee all that debt because thou desirest me. Shouldest not thou also have had compassion on thy fellow servant even as I had pity on thee? Yes. It's a rhetorical question. Yes. And his Lord was wroth and delivered him to the tormentors till he should pay all that was due him. Now notice, not hell, not hell, till he should pay all that is due, till, till. You say, what's the tormentors? Brother, I don't understand at all. But it look, it's millennial justice. It's in the millennium. And you know what the Bible says? Jesus Christ rules with what? 
a rod of iron. And it's millennial justice. And he's delivered unto the tormentors till he should pay all that is due. Verse 35, so likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you. Beat, beat you good. If ye from your hearts forgive not every brother his, their trespasses. Now this is, it's, the doctrinally it's applied to the millennium. Doctrinally it's applied to the millennium. This man is delivered to the torments till he's paid all that he's due. You know what the Catholic Church does with verse 34? They say that teaches purgatory. Purgatory. They do. They say, and his Lord was wroth and delivered him to the tormentors till he should pay all that was due him. That's what they, they teach. It's right in their books. I've got their books in my office. And that's some of the, one of the greatest proof texts to teach purgatory. That's not purgatory because this is on earth. This is on earth. This guy's alive. This is during the millennium. It has nothing to do with purgatory whatsoever. <clears throat> now, we need to keep in mind, you know, when Jesus Christ forgave you, didn't he forgive you an awful lot? I mean, when you got saved... He forgave you 10,000 talents. And yet a brother comes and sins against you about 100 pence, and you're so quick to judge him harshly and everything else, that's wrong. You ought to have compassion on somebody. Somebody forgave you 10,000 talents. That was your sins. And then you have a, a Christian brother messes up and, and sins against you 100 pence, and you go and, and, and judge him harshly like that. You've got to watch it. You've got to watch. You've got to have more compassion towards people and other Christians. So likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you, if you from your hearts forgive not everyone, every brother their trespasses. Now notice it's from the heart. It didn't say with the mouth. It said with the heart. You can forgive with the mouth and still have the heart bitter towards a person. So there is application to the Christian in the age of grace. But this is a millennial um, parable. Matthew 19.1 he, uh, well, let me show you something else. I've got to give you something else before we take Matthew 19. We, that last parable we saw in chapter 18 <clears throat> was a, an unusual parable, taking this man that had been forgiven, and he had been forgiven all 10,000 talents, and yet he, ha, he took a guy by the throat and said, Pay me all that thou owest, and threw him into prison. And when the Lord of that servant found out, he was very wroth with him. Verse 34, and his, and his Lord was wroth and delivered him to the tormentors that he should pay all that was due unto him. And that was, it's not hell because it says pay, delivered him to the tormentors till, that's a time word, till he should pay all that is due to him. And it's not purgatory. It's not limbo. But we didn't say much about it. Take your Bible, turn to Matthew chapter 5. <clears throat> Matthew 5. Matthew 5, and here's a possibility. During the millennium, there will be different councils in the millennium that will be judging people, and they'll be, uh, I don't understand it all, but here's, here's whether he's delivered to the tormentors. Matthew 5, 22. This is definitely the kingdom of Matthew 5, 22. But I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment, and whosoever shall say unto his brother Reka shall be in danger of the council. So that's in the millennium. That'll be in the millennium. And then he said, but whosoever shall say thou fool shall be in danger of hell fire. But it, we know from the context, if you remember our study in Matthew 5, and if you haven't, maybe get the tape and listen to it, and you'll see very clearly uh, what is all taking place here. But here he says you'll be in danger of the council, and that's not talking about any council that's on the earth at this particular time. This is talking about future. Christ, they weren't, nobody was judged at this time for saying thou fool or reka or any of this stuff. You can't find that in the Old Testament anywhere. They, didn't have, they had no precedent for taking somebody to court or counsel over these things. He's talking about the future. So he's delivered to the tormentors till he should pay all that was due unto him. And he goes to these, this council. He's in danger of the council. Now Matthew 19, verse 1. <clears throat> Matthew 19, 1. And it came to pass that when Jesus had finished these sayings, he departed from Galilee and came into the coast of Judea beyond Jordan. And great multitudes followed him, and he healed them there. The Pharisees also came unto him, tempting him, and saying unto him, Is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? Now, notice that every cause. You know what every cause means? Anything. Can a man put his wife away for anything, for every cause? According to Moses' Mosaic law, yes, he could. According to the Mosaic law, Christ is going to put a change on the Mosaic law and say the only reason you can put your wife away now is fornication. Now, let's take a look at the Bible. Turn to Deuteronomy 24. Deuteronomy 24. You need to drop your Baptist tradition and take the Word of God. You know what the Scripture says? It says, making the Word of God of none effect through your tradition. 
And so drop the tradition if it crosses the Word of God. If you've been taught differently and, uh, and the Scriptures cross it, throw tradition out the window and believe the Bible. Amen? All right, take uh, Deuteronomy 24. <clears throat> Deuteronomy 24. And now let's see what the law said. Now remember the question. Listen to the question. Is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? At that time, it was. How do we know? Math, or Deuteronomy 24, 1. When a man hath taken a wife and married her, now look, they are married, not engaged, as the fundamentalists and modernists and liberals try to tell you that passage means. It means they were married. It says so. It says, when a man hath taken a wife and married her, and it come to pass that she find no favor in his eyes, because he hath found some, some uncleanness in her. You say, what's some uncleanness? That, that's some sexual sin. Oh, no, man, it ain't some sexual sin. It might be a sexual sin, but it's a lot more than that. You say that some uncleanness refers to sexual sins only. You're a crackpot. You understand that? You're a nut. I mean, you can't do that to the Bible. It says, if he hath found some uncleanness in her, then let him write her a bill of divorcement and give it in her hand and send her out of his house. Now watch it. And when she is departed out of his house, she may go and be another man's wife. There's a remarriage allowed by the Word of God. Do you see that marriage is it's allowed? She may go and be another man's wife. Obviously, it wasn't someone, this, some uncleanness wasn't fornication or she'd have been committing adultery. You see that thing? Now watch this. Watch how, it, watch how the Bible interprets itself. Verse 3. And if the latter husband hate her, the latter... Now what, what's going on here? All right, here's what's happening. A woman is married to a man. He found some uncleanness in her. She's always bickering and complaining and murmuring, just getting on his case. And he says, man, get out of here. And she leaves. And she goes and marries another man. That's the latter husband. You see what I'm trying to say? He says there, and if the latter, latter husband hate her, notice, hate her. You know what hate interprets? Some uncleanness. He didn't hate her because she was a fornicator or an adulterer. He just hated her. He got sick and tired of her for some reason. You understand that? And if the latter husband hate her and write her a bill of divorcement and giveth in her hand, he sinneth. It didn't say anything like that. He didn't sin one bit if he writes her a bill of divorcement. He hated her and just sent her out. And was that guy condemned by God? No, sir. Look at verse 3. And if the latter husband hate her and write her a bill of divorcement and giveth it in her hand and sendeth her out of his house, or if the latter husband die, which took her to be his wife, her former husband, that's the one that she first had, which sent her away may not take her again to be his wife. After that she is defiled, for that is an abomination before the Lord, and thou shalt not cause the land to sin, which the Lord thy God giveth thee for an inheritance. Now, you've heard this situation. If you haven't, I've heard it a lot of times. I've heard preachers where a woman was married to a man, and, and she's talking about maybe some family, you know, just talking, and he says, you know, and privately he's counseling, maybe about something else, and he says, you know what I advise you to do? I advise you to leave this husband you're married to now and go back to your former husband because you're living in adultery. That's an abomination in the sight of God. A preacher that would recommend something like that as a Bible rejector and a very ignorant in scriptures, a Bible blockhead. Christ always said, have you not read the scriptures? Do you, not, do you, not, do you do error not knowing the scriptures nor the power of God? He constantly rebukes the people for not knowing the word of God. And if you send that woman back to her husband, you sinned against the law. And the, this part of the law is in effect. This part has never been changed in the New Testament. You understand what the part about going back to her former husband? If you're bound to a, your wife, seek not to be loosed. And if you're loosed from your wife, seek not to be bound. Seek not a wife. So if you're bound, don't seek to be loosed. Don't go back. That's wrong. That's an abomination, God said. Now, when they said, is it lawful to put your wife away for every cause? As a matter of fact, it was. How do we know? Some uncleanness, hate. Verse 1 and verse 3. Right? It, the Bible interprets itself. Now come back to Matthew 19. Matthew 19, verse 3. And the Pharisees also came unto him, tempting him, and, sa and saying unto him, Is it lawful for man to put away his wife for every cause? Well, at that particular time, it was. Now watch. And he answered and said unto them, Have you not read? Oh, <laughs> the Lord's always like it. He just, you know, he knew they had. He knew they had read. He just, he just pinned them down. You know what people do? They read the Bible and they just don't believe what they read. Right? They just let the Baptist tradition or whatever church they're in just cancel and make the word of God of none effect. The Bible says, making the word of God of none effect through your tradition. And he says, have you not read? He knew they read, but they didn't believe what they read. 
Now watch it. And he answered and said to them, Have you not read that he which made them at the beginning made them amoeba and amoeba? Brother, the Bible's against evolution. He didn't at the beginning make them amoeba and amoeba. He made them a male and a female. <laughs> That's what he made them at the beginning. <laughs> and uh, he made a male and female. He didn't make a monkey and monkey. You see, he made a male and female at the beginning. Now, you know, that's an, uh, the ideal marriage is before the fall. Now, watch, that's the context. He that made them at the beginning made them male and female. So Christ is going to give you the ideal situation of a marriage, and it was before the fall. Look at verse 5. And, and said, now this is talking when he made him at the beginning, and said, quote, For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and shall cleave to his wife. And they twain, of course twain means two, and they twain shall be one flesh. Notice the word cleave. We usually think of a cleaver, meat cleaver. You know what you do with a cleaver? You divide something. But there's another type of thing. You know cloven, a cloven hoof? You know what a cloven hoof is? It's divided, yet it's joined. A cloven hoof is divided, yet it's joined. And there's a sense where I'm, uh, we're, we're two, but we're one. And so he says, he says, and my father, leave a father and mother. Where's that quote found in verse 5? It's found in Genesis 2, verse 24, probably in your margin. Genesis 2, 24, look at 5 again. And said, for this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall cleave to his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh. Now notice, they twain shall be one flesh. You know, the first, the first uh, marriage, there was no preacher, there was no judge, there was no paper. You see, you know, what, you know what the first marriage was? It was flesh joining flesh, and they twain shall be one flesh. Look at verse 6. Wherefore, they are no more twain, but one flesh. What therefore hath God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. How does man put it asunder? He puts it asunder by going and joining his body to another woman. He, 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 that's what he's doing. I mean, and you can do it in the divorce courts and all type of places. Now let's see where the Bible...